Hey, this is Todd. I'm here with the RPG Breakfast Club chat post Thanksgiving. So happy Thanksgiving to everybody. I'm here with two new guests, which is great. Hi, uh, I'm Lucia. I uh, am the founder of a little business called Monstrous Incantation. I hand make dice and I'm starting to work my way into manufacturing and reselling uh, some of my designs. And I'm also spearheading the project, um, The Islands of Sina Una, uh, which is co-directed by the other person in this chat. <laughs> they Filipino, pre-colonial Filipino-inspired uh, 5e compatible supplement. Hi there. My name is HTT Paladin. I'm a freelance craft designer, but in the past few months, that's shifted over into doing uh, design work for uh, tabletop RPGs, both graphical and game. Uh, I'm working my way through doing some layout for a couple of different books, some book covers, and working on uh, a project that I'm doing with uh, Lu Lucy Lucia here that is slowly eating up my life. Great. So, Lucia, did, did you have anything you want to talk about? I mean, I'm happy to talk about uh, Dice or your, your uh, pre-colonial Filipino game, which actually sounds awesome. Are you Filipino? Are either one of you Filipino by descent or Filipina, Philippine-ish? We both are. Um, we're both half, but um, I grew up very close to my mother, who is full. When my parents got divorced, uh, she just recently wanted to follow her dream afterwards and open her own Filipino restaurant. So I got really close to my culture in that way. And I learned about it uh, through that avenue. And um, this was also during the time where I was DMing for two years. And I was looking for um, any kind of Southeast Asian influences in D&D uh, &D games specifically. And I couldn't find anything made by people belonging to that heritage. And so when we started on the book, I wanted to make sure that everybody who was on the team was Filipino so that I could kind of feel like I was giving everybody the same opportunity and kind of creating that opportunity and that spotlight. So everybody who's on the book is part Filipino or full Filipino. That's awesome. I'm kind of hoping that's uh, something that a trend that becomes more evident, I guess, as the hobby, which is in such a kind of a new golden era, is able to expand all kinds of different ethnic groups. I know somebody was posting about that there is, I don't know where it was, might have been on Twitter or Reddit somewhere, about actually having some kind of RPG uh, con in the Philippines. I wish I could remember some information about it. I didn't think I would need it this morning. But um, it seems like there is <laughs> definitely some definitely some RPGing in in the Philippines, are you? You're not there now. I assume we're close to the same time frame. Where do Where do you guys habitat, habitate, live? I'm in uh, I'm in Jacksonville, Florida. So <laughs> I'm not. We're not. We're not in the Philippines. But we We do work with people who are in the Philippines. So right now they're 12 hours ahead, I believe. So um, 10 a.m. for us is 10 p.m. for them. Yeah. So what What would you say are if I, I'm trying to think, like, I don't even know, I don't think I could even separate what I, I mean, I think most of what I know, I guess, about the Philippines is colonial era Philippines, either Spanish right. colonial or American colonial. Is there, what would you say is the biggest either, you know, misconception or something that maybe people don't get from the pre-colonial era or some imagery that people may have that is wrong or misunderstood? Um, ooh. There's a recent animated movie that is oh, messing no. everything up. <laughs> Um, I don't have the name in front of me right now, but they're making this 3D animated movie that's celebrating the life and times of Ferdinand Magellan. And the process of doing that, they've turned him from who he actually was into this young boy who's just trying to do right in the world. You know, he's going around, he's visiting the Philippines, he's making new friends, he's found a love interest, he's, there's a friendly fat chieftain, and then there's the evil savage who wants to push him away because he doesn't want his friendship <laughs> it, it, is this a western who's <clears throat> who's behind this monstrosity i believe it's a spanish studio okay i i, I maybe if there's a i wonder if there's an anniversary of magellan coming up for some reason why they're jumping on that oh uh, yeah it, it is spanish produced i would say my the biggest thing that i and even like as my as as a filipino myself i think there's a lot of 
misconception about pre-colonial times being like this idea that people there weren't civilized and that a lot of things that they did didn't have a lot of reasoning. And I think that also comes from it, it being so religion washed by Catholics landing there and thinking that everybody was, you know, unholy or whatever. Um, but there was a lot of community and there was a lot of, you know, practices that they had that I think are really important. And that I think a lot of people don't realize that they had like, one of my favorite stories is after the Spanish got there, you know, they had their, their rapiers and their guns and this like heavy armor and whatever else. And they were camping in the middle of the forest and they were ambushed by some native people there who didn't want them there. And the only thing that the native people were equipped with were sticks, like fighting sticks. And they beat the crap <laughs> out of the Spaniards <laughs> with sticks. And so after that, the Spaniards who were there outlawed carrying sticks around because they got their butts whooped. And I think that that's really funny that <laughs> you have these like fully equipped people being scared of these uncivilized people carrying around sticks. And that seems pretty hard to, uh, to police. I imagine is the carrying of a stick. You know, yeah. how, how, how long does it, how long does a stick have to be before it before qualifies <laughs> as being an illegal stick? You know, what do you do with the guy who's collecting firewood and stuff? It's, it's just, it's pretty funny. So if you just joined us, we're talking about the, the Philippines. Yeah. It, it's weird. Cause I think you find these things with, I guess when Western people sort of encounter or, absorb different these different cultures like there's the they just must be savages until we came right which i think right. has happened in a lot of sort of african cultures and mm -hmm. like with the philippines then there's the the kind of combo where you have the aztecs are savage but then the mayans were supposed to be these sort of i guess maybe because they were already gone when the spanish these, these sort of you know gentle philosopher kings that were you know the the classical conception of them is just being above above such petty human concerns as violence and things like that. So it's interesting to see how they take it. I imagine a lot of it has to do with how they encounter them. And yeah, once your colonial forces get beaten beaten by those people, you're probably going to tend to start the propaganda of the savage as opposed to the gentle, gentle philosopher right. sitting in the lotus position. I think it's also like talking about how you perceive native people. I think as far as it goes when it's like you're colonizing a community that exists versus one that's kind of past is it's like if you paint them as savages, it's a lot easier to then justify killing a bunch of them. Yeah, genocide or the forced conversion. And yeah, that and that's kind of the thing talking about the Magellan movie is they're, they're painting, which I think is the saddest part, is they're painting Lapu-Lapu as a villain. And so Lapu-Lapu, for those who aren't familiar, is kind of like a Filipino folk hero for a lot of people because Magellan was coming over and he uh, was basically setting these seeds of deception between Lapu-Lapu's tribe and, a, and another tribe and kind of creating this conflict that didn't exist. The movie paints Lapu-Lapu as like this mid-20s maybe kind of guy who's like buff and whatever else. Lapu-Lapu at the time of Magellan coming over was a middle-aged man who had like lived a good life and he was just seeing all of this terror and all of these things happening and he just was like, I can't, I can't let it pass because it's about to become violent and it was becoming violent. And so it was kind of one of those things where, you know, there's a statue erected of Lapu-Lapu in the islands of the Philippines and he's there and he's proud and he's strong. And I think it's really, it's really upsetting to see him painted as this savage hero or savage villain. And when he was just a guy defending his community, you know, so. Yeah. Uh, when the, when the colonists came to the Philippines, uh, there's a lot of Christian, Christian conversion and the island of Mactan, which he led was one of the islands that resisted it. And to be fair, I would kind of, I kind of understand why that Spanish company is making Magellan out to be some kind of like young hero considering just the brutal nature 
of how he actually died. Right. Well, it's, you know, it's interesting because I was wondering, you know, could I was thinking, I, I guess if this were a Hollywood film, I imagine it just wouldn't fly. Just there would be too much uproar, uproar about it. So it's interesting that in Spain, this kind of innocence, whitewashed colonial colonialism as a d- discovery or enlightenment for the horrible savages that, you know, require our, you know, white man's help is still able to fly in, in 2019. Yeah. And we're kind of thankful that people are making a, a fuss over it. We actually started our campaign around the time that that Twitter caught wind of it. But yeah, to quote from Wikipedia here from a scholar, nothing of Magellan's body survived. That afternoon, the grieving Raja King, hoping to recover his remains, offered Mactan's victorious chief a handsome, ran- a handsome ransom of copper and iron for them, but Lapu-Lapu refused. He intended to keep the body as a war trophy. Since his wife and child died in Seville before any member of the expedition could return to Spain, it seemed that every evidence of Ferdinand Magellan's existence had vanished from the earth. Yeah, something tells me that ending is probably not going to be that way in this movie. I don't know if it'll <laughs> stop probably it not, beforehand, no. but I can't imagine a, a, an animated movie that's probably targeted at a younger audience is going to have. I, I imagine it'll be like a fade to black with maybe some writing over it. But I don't know. It would. I'm kind of curious. How do you, you know, if you're trying to paint this as some kind of noble, uh, noble endeavor that meets a very ignoble end? How do you how do you paint that? But or maybe I I really don't want to know because obviously it's not something I would want to support. But once yeah. someone's got the maybe I'll look on IMDb at some point when someone who has seen it can has written it up and I can I can check it out. So what is the uh, now? Did a lot of the pre colonial culture survive the uh, the colonization? Did it get integrated? Do you still had? Did you have a lot of good you know secondary or price sources to fall back on for stuff for the for your fantasy treatment? Sort of. So pre colonial everything was passed through word of mouth and then stuff was taken down in, in written form by Spaniards when they arrived. And a lot of time they would just like exaggerate or falsify some stuff. So we kind of have to filter that out. Like in their account of Magellan's death, they referred to the Filipinos as Indians. So we kind of have to sort through it all basically and filter out what's proper, what's not. But a good portion of stuff did survive enough for us to actually do proper research and to you know, the culture before the Spaniards arrived. And actually, uh, we were talking about this the other day, but one thing that did survive, like, healthily past colonialism was headhunting. Yeah. there. Uh, there's also a lot of the current islands that I feel like is kind of untouched in that a lot of, there, there well, I say a lot, but, a couple of communities over there still practice some of the, you know, old traditions because the Philippines before anybody came over, it wasn't necessarily like one homogenous nation. Every island was completely different. And so there are some communities that weren't as affected by colonialism. Um and obviously, like all of them kind of being roped in together nowadays kind of means that everybody is still affected. But there's there's some communities where it was less tapped because they were kind of more remote. And I think that's kind of also why headhunting did survive a little bit past colonialism was because a lot of the communities that practiced it were in, I don't want to say difficult terrain, <laughs> They were in cost you two times your movement to get there. Yeah, <laughs> they were in more uh, remote areas, being up on top of large mountains or through really thick forests. So, were these places that modern ethnographers? Am I using? I think that's the right term. Ethnographers were able to get in there and record beliefs and things like that. Before, yeah, um, there were there were there were people uh, who were still practicing kind of past colonialism. And, you know, head headhunters weren't like they they practiced the the traditions in their own kind of communities up in the mountains, but they would also travel out to other communities, sometimes to headhunt. And so there was some sharing of it. And now, like, you can go to a lot of the places where it took place and you can see kind of some of the relics. and. It's kind of funny to me because a lot of people think it's kind of gross or creepy, but then they go visit the catacombs. Well, I mean, the funny thing is, is a lot of that stuff ended up in museums because Europeans and Americans at certain points were going over to these places and collecting them and buying them and bringing them home from their own personal collections. 
you know, oh, yeah. oh I'm, we're going to go take travel through New Guinea. Let's get ourselves some shrunken heads or whatnot, you know? So yeah, they're kind of grisly, but yeah, no more, no more grisly than going and seeing the relics of saints and cathedrals or yeah, right. traveling somewhere and buying a, a shrunken head to put as a curio in your living room yeah. and you're killing them anyway. It's not like one method of killing is somehow nicer <laughs> than another poor, poor, poor guy is still dead or lady, whoever. I guess I want to talk about, so what is the, what is the cosmology like? What was the mythology for the pre-colonial Philippines? There was a lot of, this was actually what got me interested in the mythology when I first started was I found one of our artists who are working on the project now, I stumbled into their artwork before the book even started and they were making uh, this gorgeous art for some of the deities that existed pre-colonially and I you know growing up I was a big Percy Jackson reader I loved Greek mythology Egyptian mythology like all these different pantheons and so I ended up looking into the gods and the deities first and um, there is a long list of things and people that they kind of worship some communities worship like one god some of them worshipped many, depending on what thing they were kind of trying to appeal to. But there was also a lot of believing that every item inherited a spirit, that everything kind of worked in tandem spiritually. And so that's something that we have had a really interesting time kind of taking into the RPG space, because to me, at least, I think the ancestral connection of your bloodline to the ones before you was so important and is so interesting because oftentimes you know you have adventurers who aren't necessarily connected to their parents or their parents past and it's kind of like this solemn idea of you know the orphaned adventurer whereas here like if your parents have passed away and you're taking on this role in the islands of Sina Una, it's more of like an appreciation and you keep moving forward in their name. And it's, it's a lot, it's still solemn, but it feels like they're more attached to you and they're closer to you. So is that something, something that you guys are going to pull into your character generation? You're going to have who are your parents, who are your parents' parents kind of generate some kind of line that goes, I mean, it seems in a bit, I've been reading a lot about the fall of Rome and they kind of had a similar, I mean, obviously they're the Roman gods, but there was very much this connection to your family and trying to continue on and constantly up, up, up what your forefathers, you know, your forebears did for you. Yeah, we've been, we've been working on two new classes, both of which are very spiritually inclined. One of them being the headhunter, like we talked about. And the other being a Babylon, which was kind of like the spiritual priestess of a community. Both classes are very involved with not necessarily your specific ancestors, but kind of the spiritual connection of the entire community. Because when you would headhunt, you would, you know, you take the head back and in order to preserve it, you would also welcome that spirit into your community. And so to do that, you have to be respectful of certain omens and of, you know, guidance that comes from this otherworldly influence. And with Babylons, when you heal people, a lot of the accounts um, actually talk about the idea of channeling those spirits and letting them either possess you or the patient in order to use those powers. So we're trying not to limit it so much to you specifically as far as spirits go, but there's definitely, if you're playing as either one of these classes, you, you'll be very aware of the fact that there is an afterlife and there is like a space kind of between the afterlife and all of them are connected to you. <laughs> no, that's very cool. So with the, I guess, particularly with the headhunter, but I guess this applies to other things. Have you decided how you're going to address that as far as not only just, uh, not only the mechanics, but you know, it's one of those things that's going to be, I imagine just because of what it is. It's one of the things that obviously it did exist, but it's also one of the things that gets probably sensationalized 
in cultures more of the most in cultures that Definitely. had that impact. Have you figured out how you want to address it? Obviously, it's part of the it was it was part of the the cultural thing. So you want to bring it in, but you obviously want to treat it. I think you know talking about the spiritual side is amazing because that speaks to giving a little more depth. But a lot of this stuff once it hits the table or the internet or whatever, a lot of times that stuff that could be seen that people might even just blow by it as, oh, that's just the flavor text kind of thing. But obviously this, you're trying to bring this kind of fantasy version of this culture sort of life that it's maybe more than just flavor text. Have you figured out how you want to address it? Give it more, I guess, gravitas that maybe people might just ignore as the, let me just skip to see what benefits I get and not this other stuff. I don't think I'm ever going to be able to stop people from just skipping over fluff text and going straight for mechanics. Kind of like how I'm not going to be able to like, Stop people from power gaming if they want a power game. It's just a thing that people do. But in terms of sensationalism, I mentioned before that I do these posts since like the start of September, three days a week. And the second one I did was actually talking about sensationalism. And the only real way for us to avoid it is just to uh, do our research and be honest about it. Uh, a lot of times, especially with Orientalism, it's always uh, making everything exaggerated, making everything uh, more dynamic by making stuff up to fill in what you don't know. But if you know enough about a certain topic, you can talk about it in interesting ways. So with the uh, headhunter, it's not just that savage. There's that spiritual aspect to it. There's that reverence towards it. And there's the whole omen aspect to them. It's weird. It's nuanced. It hasn't really been covered before, honestly. And as long as I do my research and homework, I can make something that is interesting both mechanically and for flavor. Oh, no, absolutely. Yeah, you can't, you can't ever stop it. I guess I guess I was wondering, you know, if you try to get more people aware of it or maybe get them more. Because I think if you can, I know someone, you know, particularly growing up, you know, if you could interest me or, I don't know, get me somehow, then the fluff text becomes more than fluff text. It's no longer fluff text because it's really the stuff that I want. And I and I guess I was just wondering if there was anything that you guys or any approaches you're taking to try to, you know, trigger that, I guess, response in people. But uh, what is the omen aspect? Or I guess give me some of these other parts of it because I, I really don't know much at all about headhunting other than, collection of heads sort of thing so let's let's, let's <laughs> delve in there because this is all this is all new and amazing stuff for me so what well, is the omen aspect and what other stuff is going on there mechanically as far as the game goes we're still kind of you know ironing out those details to make sure that what we're doing is balanced <laughs> and not super overpowered but one thing that we both kind of agreed on as far as when it came to head hunting was i didn't want people to take it as oh, this is the class for murder hobos or whatever. You know, this idea of I'm going to collect as many skulls and as many heads as I want to, and I'm not going to face any consequence for that. Because when you did that as a actual headhunter, you did face consequences. Or it, depending on which community you were looking at to source the idea from, the rituals kind of change and the omens kind of change. Some of the headhunters looked specifically to deities. I believe there is one of which they follow a kind of a god of war, but not as <laughs> not as wrathful as some of the gods of war that we're familiar with. It was more a deity that was kind of like that balancing scale between what was enough to go to war about versus what was not. So there were headhunters who kind of, you know, took that side of things. There were headhunters that looked specifically to their leader, their spiritual leaders in their communities and would ask for guidance as far as would this be correct? Would this be respectful? And their spiritual leaders would work with would work with spirits to get any kind of answers. Sometimes that was done through rituals. Sometimes it was done through observing. And omens were definitely a big part of both of those in that spirits would sometimes send you omens or deities would sometimes send you omens. And they're kind of similar to like omens that we're familiar with in something like Norse mythology, where if you got a certain kind of animal appearing to you more often, then it was okay. Or if there was a sudden storm or, you know, a sudden change of negative weather, then maybe don't go kill that guy. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of where we, you know, if you're just going to go around and off a bunch of people and take their skulls, you then have to 
welcome them and make sure that their spirit doesn't have any vengefulness in them towards you and that's something that we don't want to fluff up all the mechanics with all that reading but it is one of those things where we do want to include it enough in the class so that people know that if they just go around killing a bunch of people there is consequences so if you're a headhunter you generally have to get it sanctioned somehow either directly from spirits or from those who talk to the spirits yeah so there were like I said, there were a lot of different reasons that headhunters practice what they practice, but the last account of it before it was like outlawed was, I believe, in the 1960s. 1930s. I just checked up on that today. 1930s, which is kind of recent. <laughs> um, but it was a group of it was a group of men who had heard about an awful thing that another, a different man had committed towards one of their sisters, um, you know, just being nasty. And um, they were like, well, let's take care of that. And so they, you know, they took up their arms and they were on their way when I believe a law enforcer was like, what are you guys doing? And it was like a little suspicious. And so they ended up, you know, getting caught. But those were a lot of the reasons why, like back in the day, that you would take up those arms is like sometimes it was out of a a very thought through revenge kind of. But for a lot of headhunting, it was like a settlement of conflict. So it wasn't because the shopkeeper didn't give you a hometown discount on the healing potion. Right, right. Yeah, you're looking at more like, oh, this person came in and like, did something really awful or, you know, I got permission from my deity or whatever. So it wasn't just like, ah, you stepped on my shoe and I was going to get on my horse and now I take your head, you know. This is not, this is not Highlander the game. We're not, we're not just going around <laughs> taking heads. Right. I assume there's no quickening that happens afterwards or anything like that. Now the now the I guess in a sense it's the kind of opposite side of the spectrum. So you're talking about I'm I'm not gonna remember the name the kind of, kind of village healer. Is that the same same spirits that, that they are communing with as far as on the healing front, or you know how does that how does that work as opposed to kind of the ye old cleric? So the the Babylon, it's you know where whereas with other spellcasters like druids kind of get their spell casting from you know the pull of the earth and nature and this connection to it. Wizards get it from reading and learning. Babylon specifically get it from their connection with spirits. So one of the things that we're playing around with is that possession that I was talking about earlier, where you would channel spirit and either they would possess you as, as the healer and then work magic through that way, or they would possess the person that you were healing to heal through that way. But the other thing about the Babylon that we're also playing with is that a lot of them had a companion spirit, which usually took the form of some kind of animal. And it was mostly incorporeal, but they could see it and speak to it, um, which was called your Abayan. And your Abayan is also like a, a form of spirit. So they could possess people as well. They could also possess you as a spellcaster. And so that incorporeal creature is kind of like your arcane focus. If we're talking about terms that people are familiar with, your abine would act as your arcane focus so you could pass through that. And that's kind of where that spiritual connection comes in is they are your channel, essentially. I got you. Very cool. Are you going to, uh, the era you're talking in, is it totally pre-colonial or are you going to have the, are you going to address kind of any colonialism in there one way or another? Or are you just going sticking to just a completely un uncorrupted by outside influences Philippines? We're shooting for uncorrupted just for the sake of we're not here to raise a fight. We're just here to show off this, you know, culture. Only thing that we have in, the ter in terms of like, you know, post-colonial is a little Easter egg in a weapon, but that's the full extent of it so far. Gotcha. What is, uh, are you guys going to be pruning down or, or totally redoing? I don't, I don't know. I, I have no idea what the, 
weapons and armor in, uh, in obviously in pre-colonial Philippines. I imagine, or I don't really even know to imagine, but I think you mentioned before in terms of the Spanish, there's not a lot of heavy armor. Are you adjusting or changing any mechanics or are you just going with, hey, everyone's going to have essentially lower armor classes because no one's got plate mail? Or are you are you having sort of either, you know, armors that existed then or just fantastic armors to sort of replace the heavy metal armors from the from the European or from the West? Heavy armor was actually present in pre-colonial Philippines. It's not the plate that you would imagine from Europe, but it was present and it was uh, hefty, durable, and did restrict movement for the sake of defense. All right, cool. So, yeah, see, I, I don't know anything about it, so do tell. Yeah, it was mostly in uh, the Moro Philippine pirates, and there's generally only like two, three styles, but we're just using that as a way to say, hey, you can just carry over the mechanics from the player's handbook. You don't need to, we're not going to like do what Oriental Adventures did in 3.5, where they made a whole bunch of new armor that didn't really do much of a difference uh, mechanically speaking. Right. Yeah, I, I remember that. Yeah, it's it was <laughs> they did a lot of stuff in the Oriole Vendors where they added a bunch of mechanics with I don't know if they had really had a lot of actual interesting effects. So for things like pirates, are you going to be obviously you guys can be having I, I assume some sort of map are you guys going to be using real geography real names or are you, are you creating your own sort of fantastic version of the uh, geography of the Philippines? Uh, making our own version just from scratch. We didn't want to do a whole thing of like D and D simply played in not Europe, and when you're playing in not Europe, you don't go to not France, you don't go to not Ireland. Completely different geography, despite having influences from those uh, European cultures. So we're just making our own lands and drawing from Philippine culture. Nice magic. So what kind of magic is it? All spiritual magic? You're gonna have more. Is there was there some sort of I guess analog to the uh, to some of the you know classic spell users or how are you guys addressing? Are you guys coming up with your own spells and and all of that or how are you guys? I guess just in general, how are you handling magic, the system, and the individual magic classes in this Philippine environment? Kind of a Double question there, I feel, but uh, in terms of just magic and spells, we're just adding in more spells, things we find in stories and myths, honing it down a little bit from how they're presented, just because we have to present this to a PG-13 audience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're not trying to make the, the book of blue fantasy here. And if anyone's listening to this, don't Google that. Don't Google up that book name. You don't need it in your life. <laughs> but uh, in terms of classes, they're still keeping their core identity. We're just making new subclasses for some of the spellcasters and, you know, that match up with some of the magic beliefs in the Philippines. Gotcha. So ye old wizard, kind of classic wizard, will be there, but you're just going to add some extra options that are more geared towards towards this setting. Basically, yeah. Like with, uh, with wizard... Um, the subclass for that is Mentalo, which was just incantations and enchantments that were written on bamboo scrolls to, ca to have the spell activate. That's still in line with the wizard. It's in line with the culture and it comes from, directly from writings. Cool, cool. So let's let's talk about monsters. What what is, is there an iconic pre-colonial Filipino monster that maybe we've heard of because it's been stolen and, and thrown out there and we just had no idea where it came from or that you guys discovered that you guys are pulling in that you guys found in different stories? Uh there's there's definitely I wouldn't say that there are any that are widespread and have been kind of turned, but there are some similarities in like monsters that we're familiar with and when we talk about them it's kind of easy to classify some of them as monsters that you know we know the names of but they do very wild the one that is my favorite to talk about is the um mananangal usually i'll preface that it's kind of a vampire-like creature and so you know sucks your blood uh that kind of thing appears as a very beautiful woman during the day but then at night where it kind of separates from like things that we're familiar with she will actually remove her legs from her torso split in half and sprout like these giant bat wings and that's how she hunts is with just her intestines kind of hanging out <laughs> like her you know big bat wings and the only way to kill her is to find her legs in the forest and spread either like um ash or salt on the uh severed part and um it, it's lore like that that has been really fun to kind of think of how that would work mechanically and also trying to think of 
what kind of reaction you'd get from your players from something like that. Just Yeah, totally. It's kind of a vampire succubus mix with the leg removal twist. That, yeah. That, <laughs> I, I'm already just thinking of the possibilities of thing where you have to find find the legs. You know, maybe you can drive it off or something. I, I, I mean, in my own head, I'm imagining, well, maybe magic weapons might still hurt it. But then anything normal, it's like you just got to run away and, and just hope you can. And then I'm wondering, like, does she leave the legs with somebody? Is there someone watching the legs? Like, do the legs <laughs> walk around? Is it one of those, like, in those B-movie kind of things where the, 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 you know, the top half and the lower half have been separated, but they're still trying to scramble around to find each other where the legs run away from you if you found them? Oh, a of, yeah. A lot of great opportunities in there. So, and... You know, that that's kind of the one that like every every person that I've talked to as far every Filipino person that I've talked to regarding the book usually have some inkling of like, Yeah, my grandma told me that story when I was really young, but then she told me to never think about it again. So the fact that you're bringing it up now reminds me and I don't like to be reminded of that thing, you know? <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, it's 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 pretty. I mean, I, I imagine if you that that would be a very disturbing. You know, that's a PTSD waiting to happen. Yeah, see so. that thing coming at you. I mean, the intestines hanging out and stuff as a, <laughs> a a lovely touch. We have those kind of like very quirky monsters, I suppose. <laughs> and then, of course, like we have our our giant uh, celestial eaters, which are some of my favorite ones talk about we have like the the eel inspired bakunawa who is a shape-shifting kind of deceptor she uh devoured a portion of the moons uh which were also personified as people and now she's in this like eternal battle with the final moon halia who kind of staves her off from eating the last one and basically plunging the world into eternal darkness. But then we also have like the celestial eater who's a giant crab <laughs> who was is the son of the sun and the moon and um is also trying to consume the final moon and uh he lives in a hole in the ocean and it's said that every time that he comes out of the hole that's when you have low tide is because all of the water is seeping in to fill the hole where he rests. Uh, so he's very large. <laughs> I, I can imagine. So where does, where does he, because he reminds me of Tamatoa from Moana. So where, where does, what is he doing? When he comes out of low tide, what is he supposed to be doing? Where is he going? He eats the moon. Yeah. <laughs> But but not the last moon. There there there, the, there must be a lot of. I, I, so what is so what is the so I'm just trying to wrap my 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 brain around these concepts of the moon. So obviously there are multiple moons, some of which can be uh, devoured. I guess maybe all of them can be devoured, but at least the last one, which I guess is our physical moon, can't be. Yeah. So we've had to we've had to kind of merge some of the uh, mythology around the moon, because depending on what region you're from, it can be the same story, but the people involved have a different name. So we, we took Bakunawa and decided to use her shape-shifting form, because it was the same story with Halia and her brother, Ulan, who was also a moon. Ulan is still in the book and is still involved, but he's not the last moon. There's also, um, so that comes from the Golano mythology, whereas if you look at it from Tagalog mythology, um, the last moon is actually Mayari. And so presently we have four remaining moons, but only one of them is still in the sky because the others have escaped trying to be eaten. And then Halia, our our last moon who's still in in the sky, kind of defends her, you know, her people and staves off the giant serpent. <laughs> Thinking in terms of uh, size, these must be just ginormous, right? Yeah. Are you incorporating their movements? Or are you going to have some ways to determine where these things are? In any, I just imagine it's really cool effect. I'm trying to think of the game there was, was it Echo or whatever? Echo, where, you know, you're, you just were giants roaming the landscape, kind of doing stuff. And if I assume that the say the crab, for example, has kind of a cyclical coming out of low tide and obviously high tide is him going back in where these guys could just pop up in different parts of the environment and obviously have a massive impact wherever there's some super giant crab hanging out. Yeah. So 
in that particular, uh, that's more along the lines of we're leaving it to, I guess, DMs determine when they show up. Because the smallest of the, of the celestial eaters of these, you know, creatures who want to eat the moon, the smallest among them is a bird with a wingspan of like 135 miles. So it puts Gamora to shame. But yeah, that's, I, that's what I was kind of imagining. That's a huge creature. I, I mean, the, the concept... Yeah. Is, is just amazing but before even, you know, anything else, just these just super, I guess, titans really, right, that are roaming the area at different points. Yeah, we have the benefit of, in all the stories, one of them goes, go, is just in the earth somewhere. Two of them are somewhere in the oceans. One of them jumps between the mountains and the sky, and the bird is beyond the sky. So they're never, like, always present or just kind of coming back here and there. It's always when they come back, when they arrive. That's that's the final word. Gotcha. Now, are they are they intelligent? Or are they supposed to be kind of you know your uh, divine, you know, super smart deity types, or are they more animalistic? Uh, as presented in the stories, they are kind of base. Aside from Baku, Baku Noa and Tom Banokano, which is the the crab. But in the end, it's GM's discretion as to how you know they stat them out. Basically, I guess I was already thinking about if they had something that like warlock patrons, right? If you could have be the patron of you know the giant crab creature for example just in like another way of pulling in some of that richness of, of these creatures into the you know into the different classes moon eater patron is actually our warlock subclass well there you go so yeah we're, we're, we're the <laughs> smart minds think alike yeah i uh when we were going over subclasses and um paladin has spearheaded a lot of them just because he was working a lot closer with the researcher who was helping helping with them when he was like yeah, we're going to do the Moon Eater patron for Warlocks. I was like, I can't wait for my deity to be a giant crab. <laughs> uh, totally. And the thing is, that's really cool about it is, you know, I've said multiple times, it's funny how DMs always like to bring Warlock patrons into the mix, but these creatures are physically around. I mean, may not be anywhere near you, but it's not like they're on a different plane or somewhere in the outer, you know, madness of space and deep space. Right. Like they are actually close relatively close by you know so that if they do come and affect the story there's a lot more draw from because yeah they they're in the world definitely well this the stuff about this i could probably ask you guys questions about the stuff with the fantasy philippines forever <laughs> sorry i was looking for something so you talked about like monsters and like iconic stuff and i got into into my mind the reason why we don't really have an iconic monster towards the western audience is because a lot of people don't really know about the monsters themselves. I, I just combed through a bunch of D&D history real fast to double check this, but only one real monster from the Philippine mythology has been presented in D&D, and it's the Burbalong. And it showed up in 1st edition, 2nd edition, 4th edition, and it's currently present in 5th edition. The problem is that they missed the mark with presenting it, because the Burbalong, when in, in the you know, stories, it's presented as this humanoid figure that has kind of a leathery appearance. And with the Berberlong in D and D, it's just a medium sized imp. Yeah, I think I can I can picture. I want to say it's in the at least in first edition, it's in the fiend folio, and I almost feel like I can see it in my mind's eye. But yeah, I think my when you said the name, that's definitely what I thought of was like yeah, medium sized kind of impish creature. So what is what is uh, what is special and and different and that they missed besides just the them I guess overly simplifying it down what what is the drawing from what you guys know is what is the what is the true story of the Burbalong so the Burbalong in D&D is presented as as a biped it's gaunt lanky leathery skin which was black in color wide eyes that were glowed and were white and they had a huge pair of bat wings um but the Burbalong in mythology uh, it has a human appearance it kind of resembles how we think of vampires where they could have wings and they had slanted eyes but their main thing was they would dig up graves and eat the corpses so that's already a lot more a lot more flavorful so that was just that was just what they ate that was their diet corpses yeah it's it's um a lot of the things in philippine mythology are based off of uh, a taboo or something that is sinister something that you just do not do if you're at all a decent person and the burbalong is this creature that did you know the the horrid act of eating human flesh. Right, totally. There was actually a just that made reminded me of I want to say it was in Serbia somewhere in the in that in that area of the world that 
really that there's still a strong belief in vampires to the fact that there was somebody who actually went and as sort of a renegade vampire hunter went and basically, you know, desecrated this person's grave area because they were sure that they were a vampire. And I remember they were sending someone or there was, I think the story was they were sending some crew to talk to them because they were sort of in hiding because what they did was illegal and uh, and the, the police were sort of looking for them, but maybe not. It doesn't seem like they were too far to track down, so maybe not looking for, but they were trying to kind of stay on the down low, so to speak. But that the, this amongst these, you know, maybe more rural, you know, areas was still a, a belief that was standing strong you know, into the 21st you know, century. Oh, the other thing I wanted to, to to bring up just as you know you were mentioning about how all the a little while ago about how the how the islands had you know weren't necessarily part of one didn't think of themselves maybe as united philippines this is actually something that was true in europe too i think it doesn't get played with enough or you know talk, there was a, a book i read about map making and it talked about how in the 18 i think the 18th century so sometime in the 1700s someone was sent to essentially draw maps and and survey these large portions of france and he was actually killed because he went to some village and they didn't know who he was and they didn't have a concept in in this village that really understanding of france like they were part of some big come to france they were just part of their little community and they saw this stranger going up on a hill and started drawing and, and making marks and they didn't like it so they they uh, uh, you know, a mob came up and I think they stoned him to death. Yeah, you'll see that in some isolationist cultures. Uh, I know that there is still an island in the world where uh, an airplane was passing by. And like you can see in the picture of the airplane online, it's just, you know, perforated with spears because uh, some people just don't want you there. Yeah, there's a, yeah, there's some of the Amazon tribes. There's also, I think that islands off the coast of India that sort of gained fame or infamy I know, maybe a couple of years ago now when a very religious, um, American, I don't know what, what religion he was part of. I think, I don't know if it was Southern Baptist, whatever. He went there, even though it's totally off limits, you know, he had had it in his brain that he was going to go and convert them all to Christianity. And yeah, they killed him. And it was kind of a big thing because the island, it's totally forbidden to go forbidden. And, you know, he had to kind of pay guys off to kind of take him nearby. And then he was, you know, he went to shore. So it was totally something he wasn't supposed to do, but it was a question of would this endanger the status of the island because somebody died there. But at least as far as I know, nothing, thankfully, I don't think anything substantive happened from that incident. So those people are still able to, to live their lives as they have been without being interfered with because that person did something dumb and died for it. Yeah, I think that's I think that's kind of one of the things that we've observed as far as similarities between a culture like that and the Philippines is when I guess outsiders do come to your place of residence and kind of push a certain kind of culture or religion on you there is a lot of awful things that can happen from that and you know we see it in our country um as far as the philippines and also in you know america where you had native people living here and now you know they've been kind of pushed to the side so i i i don't think it's really anybody's place to say whether or not these people defending their their place of residence are wrong. I think it's just kind of how it is and not so much because there are a lot of ideals of morals that came to the Philippines that didn't really exist there before anybody else from the outside came in. Like there there wasn't necessarily like a like a LGBT community, but People did exist in that space of, you know, if you love somebody of the same of the same sex, then like that's just how it was. And so when the Spanish came over and they, you know, brought their their religion, people were burned at the stake for stuff like that. And so I think a lot of us kind of project our own ideas of what is right or wrong for somebody to do in order to protect their community. But to them, they don't really have that concept, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah, completely. I mean, for large swaths of history, the stuff that we find morally repugnant would have not been noticed at all. Our times and our mores and everything have just sort of evolved. Stuff that we would just think is awful, you know, that your average Mongolian or you know, Roman soldier or whatnot wouldn't have blinked an eye at it. It just would have been, you know, this is this is just how it is, right? But of right. course, we've grown to understand that no, you know, that us going to a city and making a demand and if they don't do it, killing every last person in the city and burning it to the ground is not how we do things well as far as we that know kind of as far as we know right i mean and look people still do that kind of stuff but at least you know we most people who are more enlightened thought about it but you know go back i don't know not even that long 300 400 years 
And most people would have been like, that's just how it is. You know, that, that is the way of the world. Kind of getting back to, you know, some of the, the classes and, and things you guys are doing that are you know, culturally, I guess, important or things that it's, I'm always of two minds because I just fear that, you know, that your guys, your books are going to come out. And then six months later, I'll be on the D&D Reddit and somebody was saying, oh, I just wanted to take, you know, I just took a dip in, in Headhunter so I could pick this thing up and then to make this kind of whatever. And, you know, I just go like, oh, you know, but that's just <laughs> that's just me. I guess I feel like, you know, but you know, once you throw this stuff out in the world, you, just, you know, we all understand it's going to go into the blender of thought and people are going to spin all kinds of stuff out of it that there was no way we could predict from the original material. Yeah. And, you know, as much as those things kind of are scary, it's also there's been so many spins and so many different takes on cultures that we're so familiar with, like like Roman mythology and Greek mythology and Norse mythology, especially as of in these recent years, I feel like Norse mythology has really made like a huge impact. And, you know, you have all these different influences saying how the different, you know, mythologies fit into their world and how these stories and as much as that is scary, I don't want people to feel guilty for using Filipino mythology in the same way. At least they'll be working from a base that's done respectfully. As opposed to, yeah. you know, something else. Of course, those things are unavoidable because it's the internet. It's a huge community. But also, it would feel, I think, for a lot of us, a, a lot of Filipinos that I've worked with and for, you know, just people in general, I think it also kind of makes all of us more comfortable at a table to see these influences and not have it feel like, you have to tiptoe around all the different concepts. So you were providing some control. You know, you guys were able to dictate how it's presented. So the stuff that you do put out there into the blender, at least is the stuff that you've chosen that you've had some creative input on, as opposed to somebody who just saw, it, uh, you know, saw a, a B movie in the 60s right. about it, just latched onto it, you know, which is how they did it kind of back in the day. You know, it was right or wrong. They just took the media that was in front of them. So they were taking sources from, you know, stories that they read or sensational or not and movies that they saw and all that stuff and throwing it into the game in certain cases they weren't really concerned about how the cultures from which these sources came from felt about it or their their portrayal or whatnot it's like well that's how it was in the movies or books we're just gonna throw it in so at least you guys were able to bend the narrative a little bit you know whatever to something that's more in line and respectful of the culture from which it came right and that's one of the things too that we've been talking about is how our mythology differs from other ones that exist. Like you see all these influences now talking about how for such a long time, Zeus was like regarded as a all powerful guy and he was just like protecting the skies. But then if you read about some of the stories he's in, like he's not great. You know, he's not like he's a horn dog. Yeah, he's not like a good guy <laughs> in a lot of accounts. And same goes for gods like Odin and Thor, like these really powerful guys who kind of take advantage of that. Whereas our Zeus like figure, Bathala, who's kind of like the father of the, the pantheon, was constantly regarded as a really good guy. Like he fought in these battles because he just wanted to make sure that everybody on earth was okay. He created coconuts so that they had something to eat, something to weave, you know, all of these different things. And like he loved his children. He was a great guy. But at the same time, if somebody saw Bathala as very surface level, like maybe he was doing it for all these selfish reasons and their campaign, I think that that's warranted. I, I want people to feel like they can use these influences and not have to stay entirely true to the whole thing because the more that it's used in creative ways, the more that it feels normal. And pre-colonial history, I feel like a lot of people hear that and they kind of feel the guilt that comes with it of, oh, well, if it's pre-colonial that means that it was colonized and that makes me feel sad and that makes me feel guilty and we want to kind of pull away from that and so you know if you want to play a headhunter as a murder hope like that's okay druids came from celtic culture and now they're 
they mean something completely different from what they used to, which was a more which was a more priestess like job, I, I guess. And so, you know, we take all these influences from other other cultures and other heritages, and I don't want people to feel uncomfortable using it just because maybe there's that attached guilt or not wanting to be disrespectful. But at the same time, the more that we can get it out there, the more aware people will be, the more that it makes us feel good as creators. Totally. And it, and it reminds people and educates them that, hey, these places had history before European ships or, you know, whomever sailed over there or right. walked in there. You know, these people were there. I'm glad that you that there are still sources because unfortunately you run in situations where there aren't any or they're very, very yeah. few because they just got wiped out. Oh, oh my God. Um, <laughs> so you just, uh, so there's this book that I had to track down for one particular thing I wanted to learn about for this book. You talking about uh, the sources and whatnot reminded me of this. I was tracking down this book. It was made in 1991 and had like two reprints ever. And so there's less than like, I want to say 400, 500 copies in the world. and I spent a month tracking down this book and I could never find a physical copy of it. Only reason I have it right now is because someone was kind enough to give me a PDF scan of it because they wanted to support our project. But it took me a month just to find this one book to learn one specific thing. And that's like the biggest indicative informant piece I have to tell people to let them know how difficult some of this research really is. Yeah, I mean, even not even in colonial terms, but that was one of the big laments of Tolkien is one of the things for writing The Lord of the Rings is that there wasn't he didn't feel like there was any surviving authentic pre conquered Britain English stuff because it just all got overwritten in a sense by you know the coming of William the Conqueror. So it's not even something that just happens in colonial times It's happened throughout history. And even before that, I think people talk about the the death of Celtic culture when the Romans invaded because how they totally just genocided and and changed changed things forever in that region 100%. so yeah it's totally a, a problem everywhere so what was the one thing out of that book that you you needed to pull out uh i found mention of this thing called the black river and tracking down sources for where i could learn about it it only pulled up that one book the soul book and i want to learn about that you know particular place because i now know it's the place where when you die it's where your spirit goes and your spirit is washed in its in its waters uh, to be acclimatized to being a spirit, to being dead, essentially, before you get sent off to be with your ancestors. And it took me so long to find that book, just so long. I started my quest for it in, in like early August when I got back from Gen Con, and I found it 10 minutes before I made a thread talking about the Black River itself. Wow, it's pretty amazing. Does it function kind of like the like the River Leith and stuff? And and where is it? You uh, once you kind of touch the river, it sort of permanently changes you. Is there, is there some interesting myths around people trying to get people back from the Black River or having to cross it without being affected? It's more just a place to like be there, and you are calmed down from the shock and trauma of dying. And gotcha. It, it's more of a welcoming place in terms of coming back. The one we know for the top of our heads right now is. There was a thing called, there was a thing where ancestor spirits, you know, you'd call upon them and they would guide you. But every now and then they would want to have like a direct hand in how, you know, the physical world was affected. And so they would come back and possess snakes or crocodiles. And those snakes or crocodiles would become albino. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. So that's, that's really interesting. It sounds really cool. I mean, it seems also very kind of progressive that, you know, they understand the trauma of dying and here's this way to kind of relieve you of it. It seems like a very modern concept. We come upon that quite a lot where just like, it's a thing that makes perfect sense to us in the West. And it was like presented in pre-colonial Philippines. Like we've had all kinds of support for the book, but the only time that I've ever had uh, backlash was like, I mentioned briefly that sometimes there was presence of same-sex relationships. And that was the only time I've ever had slack for doing this book. But like, it's present now. It was present then. It just seems kind of weird that there was a large gap of in-between. Yeah, was that due to... I, I know that the Philippines, at least the, my, the reputation I know is it's, it's fairly religious these days. Was that... Do you think that had to do with why you're getting that backlash? I mean probably based off of what they're saying to me in the dms very probably it's it's based off of uh the philippines right now is very 
much on a safe place for LGBT people. Right. Uh, was his name Duterte or whatever, I think. Doesn't seem to be a very nice, nice person. Oh, nope. That's an entirely different conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let me just switch gears because uh, we've gone an hour on the film. Like I said, I could go a lot longer, but I wanted to touch on, so Lucia, uh, Dice. I'm, I'm, uh, I've been playing this game forever, but I'm, I actually have not been a big collector of dice, so I should get, I should get some more. What, how did you end up in the world of making your own, designing your own dice? You know, tell me a little bit about that journey into dice makery. I finished up a uh, two year long campaign and we were getting ready to start a new one. And I was looking for a die specifically with um, certain things inside them for my players. And I was looking for one with a skull uh, for one of them and I couldn't find anything online. And I was like, well, I know how to sculpt. I know how to make very tiny things. I had never really gotten into resin, but I knew quite a bit about it. And so I started uh, prototyping some stuff uh, last year in September. And then around December time, I started selling. And um, I made a D20 with a... Uh, orange cat in it for um leo o'brien's character in critical role and um he ended up seeing it and liked it and it just kind of like skyrocketed me into the community and having some kind of place there and so when i was starting it was maybe me and like a handful of other dice makers on the scene and now here we are in december and there's so many different companies doing it hand making dice but yeah i started because um i wanted one with a little skull in it <laughs> that's awesome i just pulled up one of the, the images from your twitter feed and they look i don't know those first ones that came up on the list i'm not i can't really tell what's inside but it looks like all kinds of stuff it looks really really cool what what method do you use for doing it and how did you learn did you just do tube tutorials or what was your how did you figure out yeah. once you got into that desire to actually make it happen um well as far as sculpting i had kind of been doing that for a while anyway um i actually the business actually started off with me wanting to make D D inspired jewelry so i was making like little beholders to put on necklaces when they were all hand sculpted and painted and then i started downsizing them for inside dice but as far as like the actual casting process i was learning all of that alongside something that I was really familiar with. So yeah, YouTube was my best friend for a long time until I stumbled onto uh, it's the Dice Making Discoveries group on Facebook. And you can literally ask them like any question and they'll help you. But it was a lot of just watching people who made resin stuff in general because there wasn't a ton of dice making content out there i feel like now it's a lot more accessible and there's a really great guy who makes dice videos on youtube but i'm, I'm blanking on his name but um, there's so many more resources on how to do it now. your stuff looks amazing yeah i don't, I don't <laughs> have you. enough i don't have enough dice i feel like dice in the last i don't know maybe it's always been the way i just never was in the scene but i feel like there's a much bigger scene around designer dice and different materials and all kinds of crazy and interesting dice than there used to be but maybe that's just i just never got out of you know my traditionally you know i just need some dice to just go to the game store and buy this color looks cool of just whatever chessex dice or whatever was around i think especially recently there have been so many people bringing a very creative outlook on what you can do with them and it kind of has pushed at least the factory that i'm working with push them to be a lot more experimental with the things that they'll do samples for with me <laughs> And I know that that's kind of like a thing that a lot of people who work with factories kind of have to overcome with them is like they've been making dice for so long that they make it in a certain way. And then you're like, well, can I add this or what about this technique? And you're like, I know it's possible because I make it at home. But they're kind of, they don't get it. Yeah, I mean, you have to adapt your stuff to the automated processes that are there. Yeah, and I think, at least for me, my factory's been great in being like, yeah, we can totally do that. And it's, you know, that's been really good for me. But for a lot of the community now, I feel like dice collecting has always been a thing. Like, there are people who have these huge collections that are from, like, you know, 80s, 90s. And now we're seeing like 
this huge surge in people hand making dice and making them really special. And for me, that's including those handmade sculpt- sculpting elements, just because they're so personal and tedious. And that's like, that's my favorite thing to do. But I do like just making ones with really pretty glitter in them too. <laughs> Not, nothing wrong with some glitter. I know my daughter will be all over a uh, set of glittery, set of glittery dice. I think that's, yeah. you know, it's interesting when you get into kind of working with, I don't remember what I was, I think it was 3D models. I was reading stuff on about 3D models or watching you know, 3D models. And they were saying kind of something along the same lines was when you're doing things yourself, you can get away with having your own processes. And some of them actually aren't good but if you're just doing it for yourself it doesn't matter you can kind of overcome them or whatever but once you have start having to work with third parties in this case factories and stuff that you know just because you do it yourself doesn't mean that either a that's how it's supposed to be done or b works for kind of doing things in an organized organized way so yeah. what you're saying kind of struck a chord with me in that note yeah there's there's just recently been a uh huge dice kickstarter that kind of blew up from a company called Dispel Dice. She gained about $2 million in the first couple of days of her Kickstarter. And she's harpooning this company where all of the dice are handmade, but she has like an entire team that's helping her. And the dice are gorgeous. And it's really, it's really cool and interesting to see that somebody who was just making dice in their home and in their spare time have kind of created it and almost like an empire with it. Yeah, hopefully her operations will scale up for all the orders she's going to have to fulfill Yeah, from the Kickstarter. It's, it's very cool, but I'm sure it's also very, very scary. I know that, at least for me, I wouldn't have the gut to run a handmade dice Kickstarter just because the idea of having all of those orders would be so overwhelming. But, you know, it's still really cool to see somebody else do it and take it on head first, you know? Oh, absolutely. Uh, speaking of Kickstarter, are you guys for your the, the Philippines book? Does it have a name, by the way? I just keep calling it the Philippines book, but if it's got a... Happy to use the actual yeah. name if you have one yet. <laughs> it's uh, it's called the Islands of Sina Una. Are you guys kickstarting it? Are you funding it? You know yourselves, or are you you going to print it? Or are you just doing it digitally? How are you guys? Or have you have you gotten to that point yet? Yeah, so we'll be um digital version for people who don't want a hardcover. Um, but we're also working. Uh, we're looking to work with a company called Print Ninja for our hardcover and um, we're working with some other companies for the game master screen and for the cloth map but for now it'll be yeah (laughs) so the one that uh paladin is designing we're looking to get it printed on some really nice cloth so you can give it to your players and be like here's where you know <laughs> i am a sucker for a cloth map ever since going back to date myself ultima 4 in the box when you used to actually get big boxes for computer games had a beautiful cloth map i remember those they don't do any of that stuff before. it always, it bums me out even when you're spending a hundred dollars for a special edition it's usually just kind of digital features and you don't get some of that really cool physical just great stuff i bought that yeah. uh collector's edition of fallout 4 with the pit boy and i got the steel case i opened it up put it on my computer gave me a key for steam was a really <laughs> lukewarm experience. <laughs> yeah, for the original Destiny, I did get the uh, whatever the guy, the Dinklage bot, which was kind of fun. I don't have it on right anymore, but it, it was kind of nice at least to get something physical with spending a bunch of money on something. For sure. Yeah, we're looking at, we just recently were at uh, the Lost Odyssey Live event, which was a super amazing experience. But Matthew Lillard was one of the guests there. And for a long time, I think both me and Paladin have really admired the work that he does in tandem with Beetle and Grimm and these like really nice platinum boxes where you're getting this really high quality items and you're paying for something that whether or not you're going to use per se, but also just you're getting these really quality coins and vehicles and, you know, character sheets for your vehicles which Paladin worked on. And I think both of us really take inspiration from that as far as the Indiegogo to put out something really worthwhile. Yeah, I'm not familiar with the Beatles and Grimm stuff. I think I've seen every once in a while on um, uh, whatever the YouTube channel, I'll see their their ads come up. But what, what exactly do they do? Is, is it like one of those kind of mystery boxes you get once a month? Or they how, how does that work? So I'll take this one since uh, I do some work for them, actually. But so what they do is they'll take uh, an adventure. So far, they've done Waterdeep. 
they have done salt marsh and they've done avernus and what they'll do is they will make a expensive deluxe limited edition version of that adventure with their platinum versions they do about a thousand runs they do slightly more for the silver for the silver version of like salt marsh but they'll put inside the box all kinds of maps physical handouts that are like for the water deep box they had these collapsible shot glasses that were also part of your keychain and then for uh they they gave you additional counters they gave you all kinds of like printed paper handouts all kinds of goodies to make the game a little more immersive reduce some of your prep time and they reduce and they split up the actual book itself into different into its different chapters which was really nice so they don't do like a monthly box they do limited releases of bigger bigger more expensive boxes essentially gotcha is it all licensed stuff from wizards or do they do third party or other party stuff as well no they actually have a license with wizards of the coast when i first started working for them back in june one of the first things i had to sign was an nda so that i couldn't talk about anything they share with me because it was official D D merchandise nice well you got so you're one of lucky people got to see some of the stuff coming down the pike before the rest of us do that's cool oh yeah no <laughs> i saw the rules for the avernus war machine stuff back in june and because i have a healthy fear of hasbro and their lawyers i couldn't say anything about it it's always always good to have a healthy fear of the uh you know billion dollar you know industry giants and the arms of the law yeah nothing tastes better than not being sued by hasbro for sure and matthew lither's involved with that i had no idea i mean i know he's the gamer and i've seen him on i guess was it geek and sundry he does some stuff but i didn't know he was an actual does he own it is he just part of the group i didn't had no idea oh no the the group itself is founded by him and a couple of his friends beetle and grim those are actually the characters of him and his friend bill rehor who is my main contact with beetle and grim okay yeah i i I don't i'm not up on the i follow the media stuff but not so granularly to know so i just seen their stuff will come up i think it's on like um geek and sundry some of the shows i forget was there carrie ann walls shows i think her thing which i know he 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 was a player on had some stuff with beetle and grim but i i I just didn't make any of the connections and that's really cool i mean that stuff is really neat you know it's great i'll have to check out some of the stuff they've done i'm a big homebrew person so I, i usually will buy stuff just so i can read it and steal stuff from it but it seems really cool if you're going to run a campaign and I, and I kind of like the fifth edition style of sort of their adventures in a sense being these campaigns in a box and if you really invest in one and you really want to take it up a notch that you can go and buy some extra stuff to really make it a really cool experience for you and your table oh yeah and they do stress that like this is a luxury item it's not needed to to run the game itself which is not a, a notion i see from a lot of you know bigger companies that sell you know expensive merchandise which is one of the things that I that makes me comfortable working with them because they are very forward about how it's this is a luxury thing. You don't really need it. But if you want that extra oomph to to really help immerse your players into the game, here you go. Yeah, I think that's a big misconception. I see this a lot in people trying to make excuses for pirating stuff. Like, oh, it's things are so expensive. And it's like they really aren't. You can get away with running the game like D D with the basic rules that are free online. There's tons of free stuff in different guilds or you make your own stuff up. This idea this that you are trapped into spending tons and tons of money on stuff is really not true. And it's not, I mean the game is probably as cheap cheaper to play now than it has been at any time because back in the days you had to buy the books or know somebody had them. I suppose maybe you could get some grainy photocopies from someone, but it was really difficult to play the game without investing in at least some books. But now you can get so much with really no money at all down. Yeah, like uh, Mass Danger is saying in text chat, d d is unique because it, it's buy and cost the cost of dice. Because uh, you can play d d for free, essentially, thanks to the OGL. Totally. And you might even have the dice if you got, you or your family, have, you know, we used to do, you couldn't find dice as you start raiding all the board games you have, pulling out D6s from Monopoly, and I don't know, some of the other dice might be harder to find. But yeah, I mean, really, that's it. It's all you need to play. A lot of the games is just either an internet connection to go and, and grab the rules and yeah some dice so i don't have much sympathy for the people who want to say that it's super expensive but yeah as mass and danger says yeah there, there totally is no upper limit you can definitely spend as much money as you have in your bank account you'll find things to spend it on for gaming stuff for sure it's just not required the idea of a luxury D company if you said to me back in when i first started playing D D when i was like 10 it would have been super foreign to me but nowadays you have like wormwood who makes like a 20 grand table to play D D on if you want to um, you have Beetle and Grimm making $500 versions of $50 adventures. There's all kinds of ways to do this. You can buy mammoth bone dice for like a little over two grand. It's insane what you can do in this hobby now if you have 
the money for it, but it's still good that like at base cost, you could start playing this game for like four bucks for a pair of Chessex gray and black dice. Absolutely. That's what I was thinking about when I was talking earlier about the, all the different exotic dice stuff. I mean, someone was mentioning dice that they have and like there's some of the dice they don't even roll particularly well or they're brittle. So you don't even want to roll them. They're, it's really is just, you know, curios, but gaming RPG related curios. I would love some mammoth bone dice but yeah i don't have two thousand dollars to spend on mammoth bone <laughs> dice i'll have to find the mammoth bones myself try to figure out how to, how to i don't know use uh what was the techniques for doing whale bone what's the scrimshaw Let's see if i could scrim find some mammoth bone and scrimshaw my way to some really sloppy don't roll well dice just like live stream yourself digging around the earth looking for mammoth bones to play D D with oh my gosh that would be that would be, I'm, I'm sure somebody would just, if I could go in the, I should do that. Take a camera, go out in the woods next time I'm out in the country. See if I can just dig up a bone and I'll just live stream myself trying to take this bone and craft it into <laughs> it, into like a D6. The absolute simplest die I can think of. So besides Beetle and Grimm, Paladin, uh, and obviously this, uh, Sina Una. Any other projects you have going on? Anything other things? Obviously, you're in the uh, graphic design realm. Anything else gaming related you're working on? Uh, working on layout for two different books that'll come out on DM Scaled within the within the next couple of months. Here, I can't name them because of NDAs, you know. But aside from that, uh, Lucia has been Lucia has been encouraging me to start making my own artwork to sell through like pins and whatnot. So that coming on the way. I got a couple of personal books that I want to make after Cena Una because I am insane and I don't know when to stop working. Um, and besides that, I still do freelance graphic design. Awesome. I, I got to, at some point I'll get some guests in who have direct experience working with DM Skills because I just don't quite understand it as a, a platform, but I'm sure somebody will hit me to the it. The basics of it are that you don't have to worry about the uh, the licensing as much. You can basically use like, all of the protected property if you put it up on DMs Guild, but they take, I believe it's 50% of the profit. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the thing. And I know that some people have said that 50% all told when you're working with someone's, whether IPA or, or whatever it's called, um, their properties is not onerous. And that might be true from an intellectual property perspective. But I think number one, there's so many resources out there for figuring out kind of, you know, putting that, like I, I've, I'm working on some material myself and I've put out a couple of just free stuff, but figuring out how to essentially put the OGL on the back of whatever you're doing, it's not that big a deal. And yeah, you have to know what monsters and things to avoid. And yes, you can't use Forgotten Realms and that sort of thing. But then, you know, everything that you dump in there, you lose to, it becomes part of the, you know, open gaming, which I guess is fine if you're just like, hey, I'm just gonna throw it out there and I don't mind. But just, I feel like when you're trying to build up your own, things as a creator the guild doesn't seem to be a great way to do it but i know some people who that's, that's just all they do they're just they're guild writers guild creators and they work with i mean obviously you have a probably a fairly large built-in audience of people who go in and just surf the guild for stuff yeah but i'm just curious it's like you put in the extra effort to you know make your own intellectual property and go that route and maybe put it up on drive through yeah maybe long term a better proposition than investing in the guild for I as think long as that lasts the guild also I think a lot of people see benefit in it because there is kind of like a working community inside the guild itself as well, because it's kind of like if your stuff is on the guild and you know somebody else's stuff is on the guild, then it's kind of, at least from what I've seen from the community, a lot of the time it means that you have each other's backs. And I think also the guild kind of does its own marketing for you. So it's, I think for a lot of people, it kind of takes the stress off of having to build their own audience because that's one thing that is kind of difficult nowadays is trying to get recognition in the community. It's like you really have to be putting out something super stellar or you have to be connected with somebody who's already big. And I think DMs Guild kind of pushes that for you. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, I, I, I understand. I can see why it'd be easier for a lot of people, particularly if you're a someone who just kind of wants to put something off. I think I, I guess it's, I just see it as a very interesting choice for someone who is who is investing a lot of their time and energy into it, taking that mm -hmm. route as opposed to the other one. But yeah, it's 
there are a lot of barriers to entry or just things that obstacles that can make the other route a much more difficult. And the DM skill does kind of take the edge off of some of that stuff. It's just an interesting, interesting choice. But it, it, I can see how for some people, like you don't want to mess with stuff. I know they have a lot of free art you can use. And yeah, you have access to all everything in the D&D universe, at least the stuff that they've allowed, that they've decided is worthy. I know that Glenn, you know, who's trying to get Mistar out there because that's not on the approved uh, settings list at the moment. But there are definitely other things. It's just interesting. And I'd, I'd love to talk to someone who who does a lot of stuff on the guild and kind of how they feel about it and maybe where they're going. I'm also interested to, I, I guess it does well for them, so they're not going to get rid of it at any point, right, or do anything like that. So I guess it's a fairly stable platform Yeah. these days. Definitely. I also know that some that uh, they're, they're, if you get, you know, big enough and noticed enough on the site, you can get tapped to be a um, a DM's Guild adept. And uh, some of the adepts are tapped to go work on official D&D adventures. Uh, like in Waterdeep, one of the people who is listed in the credits is James Intracasso, and he's on DM's Guild as a DM's Guild adept. Oh, okay, I've, I've seen him on Twitter. All right, so that's, that's cool. Yeah, I mean, that definitely is a carrot, right, if you get noticed enough. Of course, in a very crowded field, but still, if you can put something out or a couple things out there really good, yeah, maybe you'll get tapped by Wizards to do something. I could see that being uh, interesting for people, get them, get them intrigued by the plumber. I mean, it is cool. Uh, it is like it. It's just been, it's just very interesting to see the folks who have, who try to go like you guys are doing, go your own kind of independent route versus the folks that stick to the guild. Cause I see some really, you know, it's not even, cause I thought maybe originally when I remember when the, when the guild was kind of gaining steam, you know, okay, little adventures, oh, little add ons, little things like that. But people are really putting a lot of work into really hefty supplements on the guild, uh, which is great. It's just an interesting choice for them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, we didn't. We were talking about possibly publishing there, but the thing with it, as soon as you publish anything on that platform, you can't put it anywhere else. Right. I think it has to be like your own person, right? It has to be an individual. It can't be, there's no corporate entities on the guild. Yeah, it definitely works for some people and I think it's a great avenue, but for us, it was, it just didn't really fit what we were trying to do. So, but I do think it's good. I think it, again... You can find some really good opportunities from there. There are a lot of doors that wouldn't necessarily be as open if you were doing, you know, independent publishing. So it, it, I think it's a, it's an avenue that a lot of people take uh, that are looking to do something and have it kind of jumpstart other things. Totally. I have noticed that, the, as you mentioned, the community is very good. I'm, I've actually joined a couple of the Facebook groups just to kind of peek in there. And I think a lot of the advice and stuff in the guild is good, even if you don't ultimately publish through the guild. So they really are, right. they do seem to be very good communities, which is nice to see. It's nice to see creators working together and, you know, everyone being positive on other folks' material and whatnot, helping everybody out. 100%. Lucia and, and Palnef, where can people find you? Um, you can find me basically everywhere. If you search for M underscore incantation on Twitter, that's usually where I'm most active. I love my community over there, so I'm usually posting there. Yep, and I just followed you. <laughs> and then my website is Monsters Incantation. It's also linked through my Twitter, my Instagram, my Facebook. So I do a bunch of that. And then you can find the Islands of Sina Una on Indiegogo, depending on if we're funded or not. Uh, <laughs> if we are, then we have some really exciting stuff coming. And if we don't, well... I'm going to figure something out. I'm going to make it happen either way. Uh, and then for myself, I'm currently only on Twitter under HTT Paladin. The message danger asks, what are the new classes like? Uh, Baba Ilan and the Headhunter. I know we talked yeah, about earlier the on. I, what's in, gameplay wise? Do you want to go into a little bit about those two? Sure. Head, gameplay wise, Headhunter was in, this, was in this very weird position between Ranger, Paladin, Fighter, and Barbarian, I guess. It had a niche, but its niche was kind of shared in different parts of the classes. But gameplay-wise, uh, it is designed to be primarily focused on melee and ranged damaging attacks with weapons. It'll have some abilities that are through martial training and some abilities which are gained through mysticism, for lack of a better word. Uh, main goal of it is to get attacks in to get uh, a rhythm going of either weakening your opponent or improving yourself. Um that's all I'm comfortable sharing just because I have to oversee its design still. In terms of subclasses, it it diverges by what uh, omens it most gets. So if you get if you choose to go with the omens of war subclass, uh, there's some focus on 
uh, learning different fighting styles. Fighting styles, lowercase, not upper, uppercase, like the fighter gets. Uh, omens of the soul would get you a bit more knowledgeable and more cunning, dealing with things from the people you've killed, learning from them. And omens of the hunt is focused more on an aspect of nature. And then the uh, Babylon? Yeah, that's our spellcaster. The main focus of it is its relationship with its Abayon, its spirit guide. Uh, it'll get some, it'll get its array of spells. It, was, it has a spell slot list. And a primary aspect of it is healing. But Babylon's in the Philippines had different focuses depending on where you were. But with Babylon, part of it is the ancestors that you talk to and commune with via your spirit guide. And so it's subclass divergent based on uh, what your ancestors are telling you to do or how your ancestors guide you, whether it's through healing, through the spirits of sacrifice, vamping up your spells through spirits of possession, or currently making you more battle focused, making you more physically oriented with spirits of wrath, which currently would make your spirit guide into more of an animal companion. And everybody loves those animal companions. <laughs> well, they like them after the ranger fix. They don't really like them. Uh, than the player's I was about handbook. to say that. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. With the exception of the uh, PHB vanilla ranger. Yeah. And we now interrupt for this very important question. How much of the book is setting versus crunch? That's a good one. Let me look at my board of stuff here. We've got about 50 monsters. 20 spells, 20-ish magic items, 12 subclasses, two backgrounds, new sub-races and race presentations of the core races, and two classes. Uh, I would say from setting to crunch, it's about a 60-40 split, 60% being setting. Nice. Now, I don't know, again, this is just my ignorance of pre-colonial Philippines. Are, what was the, you know, the variations in population centers? Were there big cities and down to small villages or were things more spread out? And are you keeping to that in your fantastic version? Well, in terms of population centers, most places in pre colonial Philippines weren't too large. Thinking offhand, I think the most you would see would be maybe 100, 200 people. Partly because, you know, you there's only so many people you didn't really have in a tribe and still called a tribe. And nobility in the Philippines worked differently than how it does in the West. But for the book itself, we deviated a little bit because we can rely on magic infrastructure, essentially. So what, like one of the big things I wanted to have in the book right off the bat was I knew I wanted to have just a big city. I wanted to have that, that stupid trope of just having a huge city. And then after I decided the population size, I realized... So how are we feeding them? But from there, we got into rice terraces. From there, we blend to animism for a volcano spirit and asking that, that volcano spirit for like, hey, please don't kill us. Hey, please give us ash and we'll give you thanks and blessings and praise all throughout the day. So we're able to have larger infrastructures via a, a fantastical representation of pre Filipinos relationship with nature. That's very cool. I mean, it's one of those things that, you know, we always kind of hand wave, I think, in a lot of our homebrew campaigns, I think even in, in official materials is some of the realities of how are you supporting these ginormous cities? I put out the last call for questions. I don't see anyone is typing. So I think we can wrap it up here. Well, I just want to say, uh, you know, first off, I'm very happy they were able to connect. I've, I've been looking to sort of widen the pool of people to come on and, and hang out on these Sunday mornings. And I'm, I'm really glad that I was able to, to get you guys on here. I hope it wasn't hope it wasn't a painful experience. I hope it was good. You guys are welcome to come on whenever. I really hope you'll 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 come back, come back again. And, you know, we could talk more about the this book and this setting, which I, I find fascinating or other stuff. But I just want to say thanks for coming on and, and talking to me. Yeah. Thank you for having us. This was fun. Yeah, this is a very pleasant morning for us. <laughs> awesome. I'm glad to hear it. Hey, have a great rest of your Sundays, and hopefully I'll talk to you soon. Of course. Thank you so much. Take care, man. Yeah.